This is episode six of Baba Yaga's Magic, Rusalki, Slavic Water Spirits. We're not going to be talking about the little mermaid in this episode. This one is all about the Rusalki, the ancient water spirits of Slavic lore and legend. Some say that the Rusalki are evil or treacherous spirits that haunt ponds and rivers and are simply waiting around for a hapless person to come by so that they can pull them down to a watery doom. But is that the real story? Of course not. In this episode, I'll be teaching you about these ancient pagan water spirits, their connection to abundance magic, their special spring and summer holidays, and the ways that you can honor and even encounter these magical and enticing water creatures. But before we get into that, just want to share a quick thing. Did you know I have another podcast all about the practical ways of bringing magic into your life? Besides Baba Yaga's magic, I have a podcast called Magic and the Law of Attraction. And it's the podcast that answers your questions about spells, rituals, and spirituality to help you harness the power of positive thought and make your life the very best that it can be. I bring you my personal blend of magic and new thought spiritualism and teach you the tips, tricks, and affirmations to manifest love, luck, prosperity, and success in this wonderful adventure that we call life. You can find and subscribe to Magic and the Law of Attraction on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Stitcher, and listen to and download episodes by going to magicandthelawofattraction.com. So check it out, Magic and the Law of Attraction, available on your favorite podcatcher or by going to magicandthelawofattraction.com. All right, let's talk about the Rusalki. So Rusalki or Rusalka. So Rusalka is one, Rusalki is plural. Rusalki are ancient and they are one of the oldest spirits that we know of in Slavic lore and legend. The translation of Rusalki is mermaids, and sometimes we call them mermaids, but they don't appear as mermaids like we know them. When we think of a mermaid, we think of a woman who's half fish, half woman, woman from the waist up and fish from the waist down. And Rusalki are different. Rusalki are women from head to toe, or they appear as young women from head to toe. They have legs instead of fish tails. Um, however, they do have some things that make them otherworldly. For example, they have translucently pale skin and their hair has a green tint to it. You can find Rusalki in groups. That's how they gather. So they don't hang out solo. They hang out in groups and they are wearing either a Vishivanka, which is like an embroidered shift or wearing nothing at all. They live and play in the sacred waters in Slavic lands. Now, most of Ukraine, which is where my ancestral land is, is inland. There's a little bit on the coast, but mostly it's inland. And so we hear of Rusalki gathering and coming out of waters that are inland waters, fresh waters, rivers, ponds, lakes, and so on. One of the things that we see as identifying of Rusalki is that they often are described as wearing flowers in their hair, these wreaths of flowers, the vinok, the vinoki, the wreath of flower in their, in their hair, sometimes sedge in their hair. And they often go on to dry land as well. So unlike a mermaid in Western culture, Western European culture, where they live completely in the ocean and they live in the water, these mermaids are able to step out onto dry land. And there's special reasons that they do that. They also have a seasonal aspect to them. They live in the rivers and the lakes under the frozen water throughout the fall and the winter. And when these lakes and rivers and ponds thaw, they emerge in the springtime and they are around during spring and summer and they bring their life-giving moisture and fertility to the fields. So they're fertility beings, fertility spirits, fertility goddesses, whatever you want to call them. They bless the fields of flowering rye with their beautiful singing and joyful clapping. And we leave them offerings when we want an abundant crop. So if we leave them an offering and they're pleased with that offering, they'll create an abundant crop for the farmer. 
Now, if you want to spot the Rusalki in the fields, it's kind of tricky, but you can do it. When you see the stalks in the fields waving and you can see them in one little spot, they're waving around, that shows where the Rusalki are dancing. And it's seen as a positive sign of their visit. They're bringing fertility to that land. However, you know, with spirits and Slavic spirits, they always like you, they are, they can go either way and the Rusalki are no different. If the Rusalki are treated with disrespect, if they're not honored, if they're not respected, if they're um, not given offerings of some kind, they might send bad weather or some kind of um, disease that blights the crops. So you always want to be on the good side of the Rusalki. So one of the things that they do during those spring and summer months when they're active and coming in and out of the water and going out into the land, um, you can sometimes spot them dancing under the full moon at night. They do the traditional dances, the circle dances. They sing the traditional songs. They giggle, they gossip. They might wash their clothes on the riverbank or be spinning fibers to make magical garments for themselves. These are all activities of the Rusalki. They also like to hang out by the water. And when they're in the water, they can be swimming in the water. That's one of the places that we can find them. But we can also find them sitting on the branches of the trees that are by the water. They might hang from, you know, be sitting on a low hanging bough. And if they are sitting there, they might ask passersby to give them clothing if they're naked. Oh, give me some clothing. They might be looking into the water, admiring their reflection, combing their long, beautiful hair with magical combs. Now that hair being loose and being combed is something very special and something very significant. In Slavic magic, in Slavic traditions over the last thousand years or so, there's special things that um, people did with their hair, right? They would, they would do special things with their hair for certain things. Now, one of the things that was just a social construct is that for women, they would cover their head when they were married. When they were unmarried, they would wear their ha hair in a braid to the side or two braids, somewhat like I'm wearing right now, right? And this would be an unmarried woman would wear her hair in a braid showing. And then a married woman would put her braids up and cover her hair. What wasn't done at that time was having hair freely flowing, having hair unbound, uncovered, just wild hair. That was a sign in Slavic culture that you were a rule breaker, that you were outside of the norm or outside society. You know, it's almost like as shocking, it would be as shocking to us today to see maybe someone walking down the street nude in a regular part of town, right? That would be a shocking thing to see. And seeing someone with unbound hair would be equally as shocking. Now their hair being unbound demonstrates that they're in the spirit realm witches, spirits, all of these people who are outside of the society, all of these female people who are outside of society would let their hair go because they were showing that they weren't part of the culture and weren't part of the society and were magical. So they were either spirits or they were witches or they were crazy people. I mean, that could be the other thing, right? Someone who wasn't involved with the society in some way. But for Rusalka, her hair was even more important. It wasn't just a way to demonstrate her that the fact that she was a spirit and that she was outside the human society. If a Rusalka's hair became dry, the belief was she would die. So she had to keep her hair wet. So the way that she would do that, obviously, is staying in the water. But another way that she might do that is to take her magical comb with her. With that comb, she could comb her hair and torrents of water would come out of that comb and out of her hair and it would water the land. So when she was walking around the rye fields and walking around the land, she would comb her hair to water the land, but also to keep herself alive. Now, the belief was if you found a comb on the bank of a river, well, that was a Rusalka's comb. And if you took it, it would give you the gift of clairvoyance and the power of healing. So it was a very, very magical thing to find a comb on the banks of a river.
Now, in pre-Christian times and pagan times, these spirits, the Rusalki, were honored as the guardians of the waters. They were really honored and they were given gifts. They were, um, and we're going to talk about the gifts that they were given. They were honored. They were blessed. There were special holidays for them and so on. However, when Christianity came in, um, in came the propaganda. Pagan ways, many of them became bad, evil, wrong. And so then the story became that these water spirits, these water goddesses, these water spirits were actually the unquiet spirits of women who had drowned or vengeful ghosts of girls who had died before they were baptized. Now, this is, of course, propaganda. This is something to distance people or to make people fear or be afraid of the old ways. The Rusalki are simply nature spirits. And like all the Slavic nature spirits, if you honor them as you should, then you will receive their blessings. You might even see them or even interact with them. All of these things can happen when working with all of the spirits. And so it behooves you, if you are interested in working with spirits, to start to make offerings or to make an effort to connect with them. But I do want to say that being said, you know, while they're not evil, while they're not these unquiet spirits that are trying to drown people, all nature spirits and all old Slavic spirits are, are liminal, they're ambiguous. And then they can be capricious. So you always want to stay on their good side by treating them with respect, treating them with honor and giving them gifts that will keep you on their good side so that you won't have any problems with them. So let's talk about um, their special holiday. There's a thing called Rusalni Tishden, which is Mermaid Week. And the Mermaid Week and Kupala, which is the Midsummer Festival, are the times when you are most likely to encounter them. Now, these traditionally pagan holidays are still celebrated in Ukraine to honor these spirits. And if you decide to bathe in a river on one of these Rusalki holy days, you make sure that you honor them because to bathe in their waters on their holy days without giving them their due is certainly going to invite a little mischief from the Rusalki. They might invite you to take a swim with them only to drown you, or they might climb up onto the shore and tickle you to death. That was their special method of, <laughs> of getting rid of pe disrespectful people. Now, the early summer festival of Rusalni Tishten is, honors the Rusalki. Mermaid Week, as it's called, was the week that it was believed that the Rusalki came from the waters. So they were frolicking and playing in the waters. And during Mermaid Week, they would come out of the waters to come up to the land to fertilize the land. This would be the time when the rye was blooming. And you would have this celebration of this upcoming harvest. The good, the rye is blooming. Everything's going to be great when fall comes and we're able to um, harvest this uh, rye, rye and make some flour. After Christianity was introduced, these holidays became syncretized with the Christian holidays. So this holiday became a movable feast and it's coordinated now with Pentecost, which takes place on the Sunday, 40 days after Easter. The following, now to sort of each region, each village has its own day that it gets started. But in general, we say that the following Monday, following Pentecost through the next Monday is called Mermaid Week. And that's the time when the Rusalki walk the earth, blessing the fertile fields. This festival also overlaps and intertwines with another holiday called Seleni Zviata, which is Green Feast. And that's another fertility festival. And during Zeleni Zviata, they decorate the houses with green branches of early summer. Linden branches, birch and maple are hung around the house. The floors are covered with fragrant grasses like wormwood and calamus to bring health and protection and prosperity to the home. So these two feasts overlap. And these holidays were meant for celebration and also to really give energy and put to bless the field so that there would be a good harvest later on. During these weeks, it was in times past, it was forbidden to perform any work during the holiday weeks. In particular, you wouldn't want to do weaving, sewing, washing linen, or even making a woven woolen, woven willow fence during this time. Anything to do with weaving, sewing, anything to do with textiles was forbidden because this was a specialty of the Rusalki and to be doing these tasks during their special week was an insult to them. And you know what happens when you insult the Rusalki. You don't want to find out what happens. 
um, to work at any of those textiles was um, considered offensive because they were master weavers. And it was believed that if you did this, the Rusalki would take away the abundance of those who were insulting them and disregarding these rules and measures that they put out there. During Mermaid Week, it was meant to be a frolicking fun day. There were songs, there was dancing, there was picnics, there was all kinds of activities. Young people, for example, would go around the fields carrying torches and they would decorate the land with green boughs to bless and make offerings to the Rusalki so that the Rusalki would bless the land and would you know, not do anything that would bring damage to the crops just to ensure that fertile crop. People also created flower and, and, and leaf wreaths and hung them in barns and on their house and so on. Green branches were attached to the horns of the cattle to make them blessed as well. And uh, people performed okuryuvanya, which is the smoking of uh, burning herbs, which is used to fumigate livestock to prevent them from evil forces, malevolent forces, and so on. Now, during this magical time, um, young single men and women would meet in the fields or forests or near the streams to celebrate. They'd bring a picnic, they'd bring food, they would make dolls representing the Rusalki, big doll effigies made from young trees, young birch trees as offerings to the Rusalki. Women, the young women would dress up as Rusalki. Songs and dances honoring the Rusalki were done. And the young people, of course, being young people would flirt with each other. There'd be little kissing games and things like that. Um, young women offered garlands to the Rusalki asking for loving husbands, and they would make flower wreaths to hang in the woods to divine their future. During, during this partying and this revelry, it was believed that the Rusalki would leave the water to dance and sing and bless the fields and forests as well. And they would traverse between the water and the land back and forth until the end of June when we got to uh, Kupala. During these weeks, many people would say that they would hear their voices in the rustling of the breeze or their dancing footsteps in the splash of the running water, or they might hear distant singing or laughing and giggling in the fields, and that would be the Rusalki. Now, the second holiday, that Kupala midsummer holiday, is the last time that the Rusalki were going back and forth between the land and the water. Then they would go back to the water after that. So in Kupala, the Rusalki would be seen for the last time on the land. Now, Kupala is an ancient festival that today is celebrated on June 6th and 7th and is seen as John the Baptist Day, but it was originally celebrated at summer solstice. And during this time, the Rusalki were believed to dance in the fields by the light of the moon and invite shepherds to play music for them. And you would find evidence of these nighttime parties with the Rusalki in circles of darker and more, more luxurious grass in the fields. If there was a part of the field that was just really fertile and really green, that was where the Rusalki had been having their party. On the celebration of Kupala, what happens is that people wake up before dawn, women get up, the wise women get up before dawn to pick herbs and flowers on this day because it's believed it is the time when their healing powers are at their zenith. The day is the longest, the sun is our giver of health and life and vitality. And so during this day, when the day is the longest, it is believed that the herbs and the flowers are at their highest power for magical purposes and for healing purposes. As the day goes on, um, women also weave, weave floral wreaths that include these healing plants and people wear, men and women wear these flower crowns on their heads to bless themselves throughout the year, throughout the Kupala celebration. In the evening, people light a bonfire and young women will float their wreaths on the water to do a love divination. How your wreath floats on the water predicts your love future for the year. During the day, people would also swim in the waters. And as I mentioned, a holy bonfire is lit. And it's usually created with living fire, which is fire created by rubbing sticks together, not flat fire lit with, with a match or with a lighter. All through the night, people dance and sing around the bonfire. And they do a ritual where they jump through the flames as an ancient purification rite. 
So couples will do it. Singles will do it. People sometimes um, take their animals through faint flame to protect them and to bless them and to clear away any negativity. Couples will jump through the flame of the, of the bonfire hand in hand or jump over the flame hand in hand as a right to cement their relationship. So if you jump through it and you land with your hands still together, you're going to be together. If you're, if you separate hands while you're jumping, that relationship doesn't have a hope. So during these days of midsummer, Rusalki roam back and forth between the land and the water. And then they're back in the water until the first frosts of winter when they are going to go under when the water freezes over for the winter. Now, in a minute, I'm going to tell you how to honor and even meet the Rusalki. But if you'd like to learn more about Slavic magic, I invite you to check out my book, Baba Yaga's Book of Witchcraft. Baba Yaga's Book of Witchcraft is an exciting book of ancient Slavic magical practices. In this book, you'll sit at Baba Yaga's side and listen to her stories about the birth of the sun, the land of the blessed ones, and the spirits like the Rusalki that live right beside us. More importantly, you'll learn the secrets of her magic, crafts, talismans, inscriptions, incantations, and rituals that will allow you to discover your own Baba Yaga within. There's even a whole chapter, chapter six, that's all about the Rusalki. So if you'd like to check it out, it's a available now. The first printing is sold out. So, you know, if you go to Amazon, I think they give you a little delay in being able to get it until the second printing is out. But all of our independent bookstores still have it because they bought it ahead of time and they were smart. So you can get yours from the usual places. You can, you know, put get on the waiting list at Amazon for sure. But you can also go to inviebound.org, bookshop.org. Those places are independent bookstores and they'll have it for you. And of course we have it at parlorofwonders.com. And Llewellyn.com has it as well. So you can call up your local bookshop or metaphysical store and order it from them. And I really encourage you to do that because it helps our mom and pop bookstores and metaphysical stores going, keeping them going. All right. So if you'd like to meet the Rusalki, um, meeting a Rusalka is considered a blessing and a good sign. The reason is Ukrainians in particular believe that you, when you see spirits, it means that you have a high moral quality about you and an innocence about you. Evil people won't be able to see these good spirits. It's only the people that have high morals that will be able to, and innocence that will be able to do it. So children, of course, can see spirits very easily. Why? Because they're innocent, all right? The ability to see mermaids or to see Rusalki was um, something that young children could do and what they would say was worthy people. So you were worthy of being able to see them. So it was considered quite a blessing to see a Rusalka. Traditionally, the summer months when the lakes and ponds and rivers are flowing are the best time for this work. Rusalki are kind of shy. So you have to come, you know, kind of prepared and you have to hang out by river streams, lakes and ponds. And then you might be able to meet with them. Carry wormwood with you if you want to avoid meeting a Rusalka. Sometimes people don't want to meet when they're a little bit afraid. So if that's the case, if you don't want to meet one, carry wormwood with you. If you'd like to meet one, carry parsley with you. And then when you encounter a Rusalka, she may ask you, wormwood or parsley? If you show her wormwood, she will disappear. If you show her parsley, she will say, you are my darling, and she will communicate with you. So you get to decide whether you want to see her or not. Um, the herb mint is also very attractive to Rusalki. So if you to see a Rusalka, go to a river or a pond and throw a sprig of mint into the water and say, you have mint on you. And that can entice the Rusalki to the surface. If they do come up to the surface, they'll say, you are our mother or you are our father. They'll, they'll connect to you. They'll say your family, basically. So that's another way to meet a Rusalka. Mint and parsley grown in your garden can also attract them because remember, they travel between the water and the land. And so they might go into your garden. And if you have mint and parsley, they're more likely to go into your garden and bless it with fertility. Now, if you want to honor the Rusalki, it's a good way to get started. I mean, we're talking about all this meeting, but it might be better to get started just by honoring them first and building up that positive relationship before you meet them. So ways that you can honor them, ways that have been traditionally done, for example, have been to make sacrifices and honoring, uh, sacrifices and honoring, sacrificing and 
sacrifices and offerings to the spirits of sacred wells and sacred waters. So take cloth or ribbon and tie them to the trees near the well, the pond, the water, the stream, the lake, whatever. Food, money, even jewelry are the sacrifices that are thrown into waters as gifts for the water spirits. And if you do this in return, the spirits and the waters will provide healing and blessings to you. One way to show the Rusalki that you have good intentions is to bake some rye bread and use blessed water with it. I talk about blessed water in my book. There's lots of different blessed water, so you can read about it there, but make some rye bread. Leave it on your windowsill while it's still hot from the oven, and that delicious scent will entice them to come to your home. And as spirits, they will feed off of the aroma. Traditionally, people would bring this bread to a field at sunrise as an offering to the Rusalki, but you can alternatively bring it to a river, a stream, a lake, or a pond, or you can offer it in your garden to feed the Rusalki and invite them to bless the land. The Rusalki are weavers, are master weavers, remember? So if you gift them with something cloth related, they will also receive that very well. Gift them with a handkerchief, some skeins of some hand spun yarn, a piece of fine hemp or linen cloth that they can show, sew into a shirt. Any of that would be a great offering for the Rusalki. Hang your offering on the branches of the trees that overhang rivers or lakes or springs. And if you're at a holy spring, you can splash water on your eyelids to ritually cleanse yourself of negativity and then leave a coin in the water or tie ribbons to the branches of the nearby tree for payment. Now, during mermaid week, you can bring fresh cuttings into your home in the traditional style. You can bring some lovage and calamus leaves and scatter them on the floor. You can hang mint over your door or over your home altar, or you can decorate the outside of your home with linden, birch branches, and maple boughs. Now, if you want to develop a relationship with these water spirits, if you're intrigued with them and you want to really develop that spirit, uh, uh, that connection to these spirits, what you can do is you can be of service to them. Clean up a river bank or a lake shore, go swimming in those natural waters and leave nature respecting offerings such as coin, bread, eggshells dyed yellow with turmeric or the pieces of cloth that I mentioned. You can leave the coins, the bread or the eggshells in the body of water that is sacred and sacred to them. And a beautiful ancient way that you can commune with these spirits is also to weave a vinok, a wreath of fresh flowers or sedge, and you can wear that wreath, or you can give it as an offering in the forest or the fields or at the river or the lake, or you can use it as a divination tool. Wearing a beautiful flower crown is a time-honored way to celebrate the Rusalki. And in recent years, these wreaths called Vinoki have really become this very powerful symbol of Ukrainian cultural identity. If you've been watching my posts, you'll see lots of people wearing Vishivanki, the embroidered blouses, and wearing Vinoki, the flower crowns. Making, wearing, and using these wreaths um, is really even become part of high fashion, but they are very, very old magic. And there are people, there are records of people using magical wreaths going back 3000 years, but we can know that really the use of wreaths and magic goes back even further to before written history. Wreaths are not worn just to look pretty or to wear to your Coachella festival wear or whatever like that. They can be worn for that, of course, but in Slavic magical practices, they're worn to bless and protect the person wearing them. Now, a tra super traditional kupala vinok is wo woven from 12 magical flowers and foliage on that special day. But the 12 special plants really varies from village to village. So there is no one 12 special plants, but there's a lot of crossover. If you look in the back of my book, I have a listing of the important plants and what they're used for. And there's a listing of the plants that are used in the Vinok. And so you can look there in the back of the book. Um, for centuries, the tradition has been that as soon as it dawns on the morning of Kupala, as I mentioned before, the women go out, they wash their faces with the dew collected from yarrow flowers. And then they go into the forest and fields to collect flowers for wreaths and herbs for healing. But those magical wreaths, the Vinok, Vinoki can be really created at any time. The herbs and the flowers in the Vinok have a language to express your wishes and intentions for your magic. 
Now, lastly, I'll say this, the V-Nook don't, the v doesn't have to be worn. You can make a V-Nook to hang on your door or window to protect the home and family from all negative negativity, disease, misfortune, and so on. So I encourage you to explore creating a V-Nook. There's a chapter in the book, chapter six tells you how to make a V-Nook, or you can make one with me in my workshop. So there you go. That about does it for this episode of Baba Yaga's Magic. If you would like to get even more info about Slavic magic, then check out the learn page over at the Parlor of Wonders, where you will find a ton of resources, including workshop, blog, blog articles, past podcast episodes, and the way to join me live over Zoom for the Magic Q&A Tea Party every Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. Just go to parlorofwonders.com and click on the learn tab to see all the goodies there. I want to say thank you to all the spell squad members out there who have subscribed to and shared this podcast with your friends. Thank you to the fabulous folks who have left reviews on iTunes and Stitcher. And those reviews really help to get the word out to the wider world about the podcast. And I appreciate you taking the time to do them. I want to say thank you to Jill Navarre for production and engineering. Thank you to you for joining me. And I'm looking forward to next episode when we'll be learning about Slavic rainwater magic. Until next time, this is Madam Pamita and Baba Yanka saying za mahiu to magic. And may all your stories have the happiest fairy tale endings. <laughs>